Coming up next on This Week in Computer Hardware, desktop SSHDs, 12 months of driver performance, the future of hybrid drives, mini ITX memory, CPU or GPU upgrade, and more. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 208, recorded March 7th, 2013. Hard drives ain't dead. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Ting.com. Ting is a new mobile phone service that makes sense. Save money with Ting, pay for what you use, doesn't require a contract, and offers unlimited devices on one pooled plan. To save $25 on your first Ting device, visit twitch.ting.com. That's twitch.ting.com. Welcome to Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that tries to bring you the most engaging, important, and useful news in computer hardware, whether it's OS X, Mac, Windows, Linux, or our actually beloved tablets. We're going to try to bring it to you in a useful format. And of course, we love your viewer questions. We love answering your questions. We'll get to that a little later on in the show. Right now, though, it is time to introduce Mr. Not Happy About His Basketball Team this afternoon, <laughs> Ryan Shrout. I'm going to be, I'm going to be pigeonholed like that for the rest of the episode. <laughs> no way. I look a little grumpy. It's because I am, that kind of thing. <laughs> Brian looks irked it's because his <laughs> beloved. Oh, man. Hey, you yeah. know what? It was like, what, another 30 games in the season? No, no. That, this We've only got one more game of regular season. So at this point, the pain will either end or we will end triumphantly, and then we can move on with our lives. So not a big <laughs> Yeah, I was laughing. A friend of mine got really upset about a hockey game one year, and I'm like, dude, there's 140 games left in the <laughs> season. He's like, oh, I yeah. never thought about it that way. <laughs> like, so that you got, didn't You work. got a lot of chances. So it's kind of interesting, right? You know, you look at one game, you, you may be up, you may be down, but it's more interesting to look at the course of a season, the entire series of events, which brings me in what may be an awkward sports ball segment, segment, <laughs> segue, segue thing, uh, transition to the 2012 AMD and NVIDIA driver performance summary review. Not the most elegant title, but incredibly accurate because a hard OCP did this really interesting thing. They sit down and they they pick a whole bunch of the driver releases. They grab the driver releases from AMD and NVIDIA. They put them on a test bed and they look at the performance across a set of games. So, you know, AMD drivers, RC11, CAT 12.2, 12.3, 12.4, 12.6, 12.8, the first uh, driver to offer Windows 8 support, uh, 12.8. The first one was dated August 15th. The second, 12.8, was dated December 3rd, 2012. Quote, the first driver to improve performance in Far Cry 3 by up to 25%. Um, then NVIDIA, they start with R300, 301.42, 306.23, and on and on and on and on and on. 310.33 beta dated October 23rd, 2012. This driver provided several performance increases for the GeForce GTX 680, including up to 11% faster performance in Skyrim. Um, ran it all on a, a, a Intel Core i7 3770K, overclocked up to 4.8 gigahertz, 8 gigs of uh, RAM, uh, Caviar Black, right? Not going to impact graphics performance. Um, all the power supply, uh, an Antec 1200 watt uh, uh, PSU, and they looked at the uh, AMD Radeon HD 7970, the GeForce GTX 680, um, the Radeon HD 7950, and the GTX 670. And it's really interesting to look at how this sort of um, evolves over the course of the year. So they took, uh, let's see, Far Cry 3 would be kind of like the, the really big one that stands out for me. But they basically looked at the performance and how it shifts over the course of the year with Far Cry 3, Max Payne 3, Elder Scrolls, Skyrim, obviously a huge game last year, Battlefield multiplayer. And then they analyze what's going on with the drivers, the performance and issues that the vendors may or may not have had with having support for new games in place when the games are releases and or performance boosts. Because it's amazing. Like one of the big things I've I've been having complicated issues involving getting uh, GPU drivers to run in uh, in Linux because I'm playing around with uh, running Steam on Linux, right. which is really cool. Um, but setting up the drivers is a wicked ripping nightmare. Um, but I want to say that uh, Linus uh, Torvalds, the sort of originator, the, the heart of the Linux movement, the, the, the guy that kind of started it, um, said some very not nice things to NVIDIA that 
were fundamentally accurate. And NVIDIA released an update to the Linux drivers that like boosted performance by 50%, right? And it always amazes me that continually, you know, the optimizing the code, making the code better yields performance differences, uh, which, you know, usually if you would update the drive, you want the performance to go up. But it's really interesting to look at the idea here that, you know, AMD or NVIDIA can, can or cannot or should or should not, you know, mostly can or should or are uh, delivering updates in a fashion where they are released with games so that when you get the right. super new game, the super new driver is there so you get the super best performance uh, rather than waiting <laughs> weeks or months later. That's That's a very elegant very technical term isn't it ryan <laughs> yes super new super new super good performance yep uh, um any surprises here for you i don't want to i don't want to reveal too much of the article because it's worth going over to hardocp.com and clicking on it and and getting your nerd on um, but. um there, there was i mean I, I knew most of this just because of obviously having tested many of these drivers as well and there there was a there was a very definite point in the amd timeline where their performance got boosted. I believe it was in like the October, November timeframe of last year. Um, well, maybe it wasn't that late. Maybe it was a little bit earlier. Um, but they, they released, when they did this new game bundle and they did all this other stuff, they also released a new driver that improved game performance in a couple of different instances. Um, and, and so it's interesting to see how, how they've progressed over the year. And actually, if you it varies based on the game. It varies based on the resolution, mm -hmm. like Elder Scroll, uh, Skyrim, um, you know, where the, where's the differences here? So this is ultra in-game settings versus uh, ultra... No, okay, so like in one case, 7950 versus 670, the, in, the AMD card sees continual increases throughout the lifespan of the driver stack. But if you compare the 7970, it actually doesn't change much from their first driver that they test through the seventh or eighth driver that they test uh and and that's just because of cpu bottlenecks versus gpu bottlenecks and that kind of thing it's but it, it's very it's very interesting to see and i give the uh, the guys at hard cp a lot of credit for doing this because it's it's purely a educational article because you're not going to go back and use older drivers or anything like that. This is, okay, which vendor actually kept up their promises? Everybody promises to improve performance with software, but which one actually kept up with that promise throughout the year? And a year is a long time. It's easy for, for gamers to kind of forget and give people passes. Um, and and, I, and I, I think that this this kind of story is, is really interesting to see. And I, I would also encourage people to go uh, read up on it and they see the summary of... You know, whatever video card you happen to have bought over the last year or so, see how it's progressed. Yeah, that's see that that one's that one shows you that the AMD card improved pretty dramatically over that span of time, whereas the NVIDIA card, the one in the yellow there, did not. Right, and um, those are sim similarly priced graphics cards uh, over the same span of time. So, good stuff. Yay, we like the good stuff. Oh, my goodness. Sorry, I just clicked on the wrong link. Uh, Seagate is going to be ceasing the 7200 RPM mobile hard disk drive production this year. It's an interesting, uh, an evolutionary year, right, as, as solid-state drives are starting to take over the performance universe. Uh, and more importantly, solid-state drives are dropping dramatically over the last couple of years in cost per gigabyte, and the capacity is going up. Uh, it's really interesting that basically Seagate's like, we're done. Um, Tim Berry up on PCPro.com. Seagate Technology, the world's second largest hard drive manufacturer by market share, recently announced they will be ceasing production on notebook hard drives featuring 7200 RPM spindle speeds. According to Xbit Lab, Seagate Director of Marketing and Product Management, David Burke stated that, quote, we are going to stop building our notebook 7200 RPM hard disk drives at the end of 2013. Uh, as uh, Tim notes, this is a curious move uh, for a company that makes their money on uh, hard disk drives, spinning hard disk drives. Uh, but uh, right after that announcement, of course, came the announcement that Seagate uh, would be shipping its first desktop hybrid drive and its third gen laptop models. And I, I wrote the names down because this is big. Momentous XT, right? You know that name. Yep. You love that name. It's over. We now have the desktop SSHD, a 3.5-inch uh, desktop size, 2 terabytes uh, spinning traditional hard drive uh, with 8 gigabytes of flash, right? If you're not familiar with the hybrid drive concept, the idea is that you put a whole big chunk of flash on that. The flash cache is data that's commonly used or the data that's coming up next from the hard drive to enable it to move faster into the CPU for processing. It's good stuff. Uh, the laptop 
uh, momentous drives have been out for a while. They are now the laptop SSHD, which is one terabyte, nine millimeter, uh, 2.5 inch drive, and the laptop thin SSHD, which is 500 gigabytes uh, in a seven millimeter, 2.5 inch package. Pricing information is TBA, to say the <laughs> least about that. Um, and, uh, and Gadget has a good write up with a link to the full press release. Uh, I'm, I, for one, am actually really kind of curious and excited to see that one terabyte uh, momentous drive because what you get is a lot of the performance for things you do regularly by using that drive. You're not going to get all the SSD performance, um, but you'll get for stuff you use a lot, you will get uh, SSD-like performance out of that drive, which is pretty cool. Uh, do you, do you find it significant that they're getting rid of the mobile 7200 RPM drive? I guess not if they're kind of doing that across the entire line. Right? Well, I would... You know, it was funny, um, several years ago, a long time ago, uh, it was really interesting that they started really bumping up the aerial density on the 5400 RPM drives. Um, you know, uh, it was interesting. It's basically like the aerial density on the 5400 RPM drives did a huge evolution. And for a period of time, the 5400 RPM drives were faster than the 7200 RPM drives because the aerial density on the platter had gone up so much. The aerial density, the, the number of bits stored per inch had gone up so much that yep. at 5400 RPM, that drive was moving more data underneath the head than a 7200 RPM drive was moving. So maybe Seagate's gotten to the point where the additional heat or noise or, um, you know, capacity that they can bring with a 7200 RPM knives, well, capacity not being a negative thing, the more heat or noise or power consumption of a 7200 RPM drive is less desirable. Or maybe they looked at it and was like, hey, we can get you know, a performance, you know, it's, it's kind of curious. Like at some point, I think they probably did the math and said, these things are a bigger pain or there are too many difficulties in producing these, or we need to really streamline things. Um, I'm really curious because Seagate's, you know, I've, I've got, um, one of Seagate's really cool, uh, wireless drives in for testing. I have a sort of a mini roundup going up with a, a trio of those products. And it's really interesting to look at how this market is evolving because SSDs aren't everywhere, but boy, are they threatening to be everywhere in a couple of years. Um, obviously you no know, affordable three, you know, three terabyte drives are back down to 150 bucks. Um, but you know, in a, in a SSD form factor for a notebook, it's probably getting to be a tougher and tougher sale for a performance buyer to choose an SS to choose a 7,200 RPM drive over an SSD. There's just, you know, capacity is better, but then you can get the momentous, you can have the capacity, uh, and you know, a performance boost, excuse me. Uh, it is no longer the momentous. I apologize. Uh, the laptop. <laughs> yeah. The laptop uh, SSHD. It's going to be confusing. Laptop and laptop thin SSHD. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's a good thing. I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious to see how this evolves. And I'm curious to see, you know, how serious Seagate does or does not get about uh, SSDs. So... It should be very, very interesting. Yep, the dramatic shift. Kind of story stuff. Yeah, to say the least. Uh, I was safe. Yeah, uh, we have one of these in for testing. Uh, I, 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 I almost want to like you know. We're not going to beat Alan on the benchmark testing, so we'll have to beat Alan on the destructive testing. <laughs> you want to tell us what's going on with the new, uh, uh, the new uh, IO Safe N2? So the IOSafe N2 is a, a, a basically a combination of a couple of devices that we looked at last year, the Solo Pro and the Synology Disk Station NAS device. Um, and the Solo Pro was a single hard drive that was in kind of a, what they call disaster proof packaging. Uh, the problem was it was just a single hard drive. So if you had, you know, a drive failure, you had you had the same problem that you would with in a lot of other cases. And on the right hand of that photo, you saw the Synology that made it a nest. So you could plug the single USB connection into the uh, disk station and create a kind of um, somewhat destruction-proof combination. <laughs> but the, the Synology was not very destruction-proof. So in comes the new N2. It basically combines the two devices, and uh, you get a two-drive, uh, RAID 1 array uh, of, of up to 8 terabytes, or you can get it bare bones with just the, uh, just, the, just the platform and you can install your own hard drives. And it is, quote, fireproof and waterproof. Uh, it's fireproof up to 1,500 degrees for 30 minutes. That's 1,500 degrees for 30 minutes. And it can be submerged uh, for, at 10 feet for 72 hours, um, which is 
pretty pretty disaster proof, I guess, right? They've they've <laughs> they've done videos where they light it on fire and they run it over with a backhoe and they, you know, do that kind of thing. And then they take the hard drives out of the slightly deformed, malformed chassis, and you can read the hard drives and get your data off and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's, you know, it, in terms of performance, it it's it's kind of like uh, any other NAS device. It's it's fairly high speed for a NAS. I think. Um, if we, what did he say here? If we, if we got re- read speeds in the 91 megabyte per second range and write speeds in the 54 per, uh, 54 megs per second range, um, and that is if you um, don't have the overhead of the USB link, that's just going directly into uh, uh, the connection there. But it's so it's it's relatively fast for uh, this type of NAS device. But then the real key is if you look in the internals. And you start to see all of the fireproofing, all of the you know the destruction proofing that they have built into this device, and it's not it's not super cheap. You're looking at about six hundred dollars for I think the bare bones model before you know you you buy and, and add your own hard drives in that type of, that type of thing. I think that's what it's yes, six hundred dollars for the diskless model, uh, all the way up to two thousand dollars for the eight terabyte of capacity, and a further twenty six hundred dollars uh, and further. To, to twenty six hundred dollars with eight terabytes of capacity using enterprise class drives, and then that includes um, what they have. They also include like insurance as part of it, right? Data recovery insurance offered through IO Safe, so that if you do have that disaster, they will help you get that data off of those drives, um, and you can actually extend that out to five years or whatever, depending on uh, what your particular business's needs are for that. So. Uh, I tr- I've been trying to convince Alan to put it into a furnace, like a get, you know, like a coal fire or something like that. Just to really, I mean, I feel like this needs to be done. Uh, but you have you have plans for that, I assume. Me? No. It sounds like something. <laughs> <you think. laughs> no, no comments. I don't want to reveal any secrets. Uh, right. Water was certainly involved. Yeah, that, that's an easy one. That's an easy one. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Water's easy. Running yeah. things over is easy. Uh, uh, we'll, 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 we'll talk about fire later on. <laughs> All right. So, you know, that's, it's, this is not it a NAS device for everybody. No. Um, one of the, it, one of the primary, if you have data that you don't want to put up on a, you know, a cloud server or if your bandwidth, you know, if, if you live in, I, I, I have some friends who live in, uh, they don't live in earthquake country. They live in forest fire country. And the idea of being able to chain down a, uh, a storage device or have additional fireproofing on a storage device would be a really big deal for them because they have satellite internet and the options for uploading uh, data are just fundamentally non-existent. Um, Padre, Padre is in the chat and he's played with one of these devices and he had a quote cool tech point. It uses, uh, for the IOSAFE into it uses ceramic layer that is embedded yep. with water to provide uh, an Ablative, ar- ablative armor in a fire as the ceramic starts to burn, the water evaporates, turns to steam, and creates positive pressure within the case in order to prevent smoke damage to the drive. So they yeah, they spent a lot of time designing this. This is not just a chassis. We we pulled one of its cousins apart on Texilla, and yeah. uh, it was interesting because essentially it is a vacuum sealed plastic bag around the drive. You know, the wires run into it. You know, there's basically like epoxy, uh, a putty-like epoxy substance that holds that in. The uh, uh, the the clay he's talking about, the ablative clay, ablative uh, ceramic, sorry, um, is wrapped in plastic to make it waterproof. So there's like layers upon layers of protection inside of this. There's airspace um, both to allow, you know, cooling on the device itself and also to keep the, the case itself from contacting the ceramic. It's, it's interesting. There's some really interesting engineering going on in these. And it's, uh, if, if you are worried about, uh, well, the disasters, <laughs> it's a good choice. Um, yep. So, W hard disk drive density with HGST. I was curious about this one because who doesn't want to double their hard disk drive uh, density? Jeremy Hellstrom wrote this up at PCPer.com. HGST, the recently purchased research division at Western Digital, promising to double the density of platter drives over the next few years, enhancing the longevity of a storage media that many already consider obsolete. However, like tape and optical media, there continue to be many scenarios where inexpensive high-density storage is more useful than the speed offered by an SSD, like the 12 terabytes of storage in my home media server. Quote, using a combination of self-assembling molecules, 
Doesn't that scare you? And nano imprinting, they are hitting a density of 1.2 trillion bits per inch. Not quite the density of the salty drives you heard about in 2011, but perhaps much closer to market. Uh, and you can substitute the word reality for market. Each of the dots, the picture is really interesting. If you go up on PCPro.com, look at the article. The dots are 10 nanometers in size. And because of the self-assembling nature of the pattern, HGST told the register that they expect to be able to shrink the size of those dots even more as the process matures. Um, so basically, HGST is uh, formerly known as Hitachi Global Storage Technologies. Uh, it's really interesting. I love the idea that nanotechnology is going to be something other than a science fiction story or a coating yeah. on a pair of khaki pants. Um, I, although yeah, I got to say, self is, does self-assembling creep you out? <laughs> no, it's just magnetism and stuff, right? Surely. Uh, I, I, what, I, what I like is that, okay, this is... There's there's a lot of talk about the SSD is completely going to take right. the hard drive out of you know commission in the next two to three years and if this kind of keeps up I don't I don't think that will be the case I think hard drives will continue to exist uh, for local users and local systems uh, for right. the foreseeable future I don't think um, the day of complete SSD assimilation is is quite there <laughs> or even be quite near I guess I'll say. There is another fanless PSU, the Seasonic Platinum Series 460-watt fanless power supply units. For those of you who have been looking for an alternative, there's, there's not a long list of uh, fanless CPUs. I don't know why that is. PSUs. Is it just PSUs? Did I say CSUs? <laughs> Colorado? CPUs. Because there, okay. there are some fanless CPUs, but they're not going to run very uh, well on Crisis 3. Um, Almost all but, CPUs are fanless. We add fans to them so that we can use them for more than 10 minutes at a time. <laughs> True. So, yeah, I mean, this this is just a short mention um, for this particular article just because there is a shortage of fanless power supplies. And this is not quite the highest wattage you can get, but getting up there in terms of the highest wattage you can get with, uh, with the fanless design. Because you could technically power like a, a GTX 680, a GTX 670, a Radeon 7970. Um, with this power supply, uh, it has enough juice to do that if you don't have tons of other accessories running in the system. Right. Um, you do have to have good airflow in the case. You, it can't be a completely fanless system. Um, mm -hmm. So, it, you know, you, you could debate if maybe it's better to have a fan in the power supply and take one fan out of your uh, case design maybe or something like that as opposed to the other way around. But, uh, um, you know, if you don't use this for... Heavy heavy loads, then maybe you can get away with a little bit less airflow and you can put it in a really quiet home theater PC or something like that. It's just, you know, we wanted to point out that we get asked a lot about quiet PCs and quiet computing and fanless power supplies. And, and I think we the last one we talked about on the show was a 300-watt unit. Uh, yeah. And this one is, uh, you know, a significant jump up, about 50% higher wattage, uh, mm -hmm. yet still fanless and zero dBA. So... Yeah, eighty percent plus platinum, uh, tight voltage regulation. I mean, it's it's cool. It's I I, I like seeing these because I've it's it's funny. I'm, my my big challenge in my home theater is no longer making the home theater PC quiet, uh, especially now that all of my most of my home theater gear is now in a closet. It's actually trying to figure out how to put a fan that's quiet or quiet down the fan that's on my projector, uh, which always sounds like a Hoover vacuum starting up at the beginning <laughs> of uh, <laughs> fire it up, and it takes a few seconds for me to sort of you know, avoid that noise. But yeah. it's, I got to say, it's also amazing how quiet most of the better power supplies are. Although I haven't been doing any like, you know, triple L SLI gaming on a 1400 watt, 1500 watt uh, PSU. So it's, uh, it's begs. Yeah. I'm just going to have to build a, you know, multi-thousand dollar system so I can just see what there you that's go. like. Yeah. Uh, something that came out. I, I can't decide if this is a huge deal or not a huge deal. Um, there are a whole bunch of uh, all-in-one touchscreen computers or all-in-one portables or all-in-one. Uh, basically, there's a whole category of computer that looks like a tablet, quacks like a tablet, has a touchscreen like a tablet, but nobody wants to call a tablet because they're, they are, are mobile all-in-ones or portable all-in-ones. You know, we saw the 26-27-inch the, the device from Lenovo at yep. CES that everybody was excited about. Uh, I've seen a couple that I cannot talk about because I'm currently under NDA. And then there is the Sony VAIO TAP20 all-in-one touchscreen computer uh, and tablet. Mr. Ryan Shrout, you reviewed it. 
Do you give it the love or the meh? Um, I like it actually. It's um, it's it, from from a hardware perspective, you are essentially taking the innards of an ultrabook mm -hmm. and moving it into an all-in-one computer. That's the performance level you're going to get. That is, uh, the, you know, the 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 type of computing component. It's a core. It's an ultra low voltage ultra low voltage core i5 processor it's got four gigs of ram it's got intel hd 4000 graphics uh no discrete video or anything like that um but it has a 20 inch screen a 20 inch 1600 by 900 resolution screen uh you know 10 point touch it's kind of nice i really do like that stand that's being demoed in the video there where you, you can basically go from any position between what you see there and completely flat on the ground um it comes with the keyboard and mouse of course it's wireless uh, but it's obviously meant to be a touchscreen device, and it has a battery. So you, if you take it away from its AC plug, you can run for an hour and 50 minutes, maybe two hours. Uh, my battery testing showed it right in the middle of that, about an hour and 55 minutes on our Wi-Fi battery testing, um, which is which is okay. You know, I mean, for a 20-inch tablet that weighs 12 pounds, <laughs> I guess, Um so the, I guess the idea behind that is, okay, this is a computer that maybe sits in your office, maybe it sits in your kitchen, maybe it sits in someplace else in your house, but if you want to take it to another room, you want to take it to the coffee table in front of the TV while you finish something, or, you know, you're going to, I don't know, fold laundry on the couch and you're watching a video on Hulu and you take it over there, you know, you've got two hours of, of flexibility to move about the, you know, the house in that way. If your kids want to take it to the kitchen table and play a game on it while you're cooking or something like that, they don't have to get in the way. You know, it's 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 kind of, you know, we've always heard about the idea of the home PC, the kitchen PC, the one that's, you know, just kind of always there in front of you. Right. Um, Mom, and this kind you put of a recipes that. on it. Right. You Sorry. put recipes on it. You put your calendar on it. That's how you organize your family and all that other crap. Um, and this seems like it. <laughs> It, it might be able to do it. You know, you, you if you put the keyboard and mouse away, now we've got Windows 8 with a good touch interface and you start getting into all that kind of stuff. It's possible to do that. Um, this computer is actually sitting at home in our kitchen right now and I'm trying to, you know, have my wife and I test it out. Like, okay, what is this like? If Can, can, we, can we have multiple people using this where she gets up in the morning and leaves and she can write notes to me on that instead of writing them on a dry erase board on the fridge? And, you know, I get up in the morning and um, <laughs> instead of going to my office to check my early morning emails, emails, I sit down there with my cereal and check my early morning emails and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it, what was interesting for me to to think about this movement is that tablets are huge um, and more importantly mobile uh, browsing uh, whether you're talking about tablets or, or cell phones is expected to finally surpass uh, desktops and laptops in terms of internet consumption this year whether you're talking about websites or browsing or amazon.com or Netflix or whatever kind of web browsing you want to do basically these portable devices you know 7 10 inch tablets and phones are taking over and manufacturers are seeing an opportunity like oh people want to carry around a screen and watch video we can make a bigger screen they can carry around the house um right does the battery life bother you i mean it seems like battery life is going to be the big challenge because the big screen sucks a lot of energy it does uh, it doesn't really bother me because you got to look at it as a it's not portable it's mobile if that makes sense right, right? so it's not mobile in that i plan on taking it out of the house and and uh, taking it with me on the road for a trip or something like that, although it would be humorous to have a 20-inch tablet on your lap, um, you know, <laughs> out plane. of the park or something. Right. But uh, it, it's mobile in terms of, okay, if I want to take it upstairs for a little bit or I want to take it to right. the living room for a little bit, you have that capability to do it. All you do is, you know, unplug the AC and you can go, right, because the keyboard and right. mouse are wireless, you know, if you have other you know, accessories or anything plugged in, they'd have to be unplugged. But the convenience of just being able to like pick it up and move it for a little bit, and, and it weighs 12 pounds, it's not super light, but it's not like you're lugging a, uh, a, a desktop under one arm and the monitor under another arm and you're kind of <laughs> moving around that way, right? The right. Asus uh, Transformer all-in-one that we saw at CES has a similar idea where the there's a base station and then you take the screen off of it uh, and take that part with you, and all the hardware actually resides inside the screen. So uh, there, there are different takes on it, and you know we'll we'll see how it integrates into things. I mean, they're not super cheap either. The ours was nine hundred ninety nine dollars, um, which I guess if you consider that it's right. ultrabook hardware, kind of fits in with with that pricing scheme. 
Um, so I, I don't know. I, I think it's very interesting. I think Windows 8 makes this feasible, whereas before it, right. with Windows 7, it wasn't feasible. <laughs> and uh, I, I think Windows it has a better 7. shot. Yeah, Windows 7 on a touchscreen. I, I tried really hard to use Windows 7 on a touchscreen PC we had in here a year ago, and it was painful. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was, it was, it was, it was, if you were really patient, you could do it, but it was not a pleasant experience by any stretch of the imagination. We should take a moment right now to thank our friends over at Ting, the sponsor of this week's episode of This Week in Computer Hardware, Ting.com. If you haven't heard about it, which means you must be new to Twitch, I am a Ting subscriber. Actually, well, I, I actually left the Ting modem on my desk, but Ting's really interesting. Um, it's mobile service. And they want you to pay for what you use. So usually you go, gosh, if I don't have enough minutes, if I don't have enough data, the overage charges are going to be brutal. And I'm going to spend all my money on the fact that I used a phone for 30 minutes longer than my plan, right? So Ting's idea is rather than committing yourself to the maximum unhinged usage, that insane couple of weeks around Christmas or the fourth quarter push when you're doing all the sales, they're like, hey, pick a contract. It's really interesting. It's a no BS mobile service. Um, what they want is they don't want you locked into a contract. They want you locked into being happy with Ting. So you buy your hardware. That's the big difference. And then you do, you select your plan. And in my case, for my, for my modem, I choose the minimum plan, which is six bucks a month. And if I use a whole bunch of data some month, they're going to charge me a little bit more. They're going to scale it up based on the data I use. Um, but if I don't use that much data, it's going to be six bucks a month. This is cheap people. This is not a big charge. More importantly, I, I don't get hit with like 95 or or $100 worth of charges because I used a gigabyte of data that month. They just scale me up a little bit. And the next month, yeah. if I use like 100 megabytes, I'm not paying for a gigabyte or two gigabytes or 20 gigabytes of data. Um, it's really interesting. There's no bundling. There's no ride-along services. They basically, they have like extra small through extra, extra large service levels that you choose from. So Ting, is a, it's an MNVO. They're a reseller of Sprint service. It's nationwide. It's good stuff. It's not the fastest 4G out there, but it's a heck of a lot faster in my case than not having a 4G modem. And more importantly, <laughs> um, it's more than fast enough with just about anything you're going to do on a cell phone. Trust me on that one. Um, look, there's no average charges or penalties. If you use more data, they just bump you up to the next data plan, you know, extra small through extra, extra large. What's even better is if you use less data than you committed yourself to, say you pick the large plan because you think you are a maximum, you know, phone, if you think you're going to use all the minutes or have all the text messages or download all the data and you you use less data, they give you a credit for you. It's pretty cool. Ting drops you down to the level you hit and credits the difference on your next bill. It's really cool. You get voicemail, you get caller ID, you get tethering, you get to the hotspot functionality, you get three-way calling, call forwarding. Um, they're all part of the service. It's not like an extra five bucks here and an extra 12 bucks there and all of a sudden your $45 a month cell phone plan becomes $293. Ting's not playing that game. It's really cool. Um, I'm really excited about it. Basically, you know, the device on a plan, each device, you pay six bucks for every device you have. So if you have nine devices, you're going to pay six bucks for each device. But if you have nine devices, you either have a large family, a small business, or some really serious <laughs> phone issues. And that's okay. Yeah. Um, it's cool, right? You know, the, the, the online control panel is really well thought out. It's easy to use. Um, Customer support's really simple. Call 1-855-TING-FTW. I like that. It's a little attitude there. Uh, and it's for the win, by the way, not the other one. Uh, anytime between 8 a.m. and 8, 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Pacific Standard, excuse me, Eastern Standard Time. Let me make that abundantly clear. 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And a human picks up the phone, which is really, really cool. They've got help it's online. Oh, I'm sorry? I say it's pretty impressive. So what they want to do is they want to offer you guys a, a great deal as well. So that the service is amazing, as Patrick was talking about. Uh, but here's here's a special offer we have from you for these guys. Your first purchase from Ting you receive in two to five business days. You're actually going to go there and buy your own phone. Um, you're going to get $25 off of your first device when you sign up. The URL you need to know is twitch.ting.com. It's T-W-I-C-H dot T-I-N-G. Com, twitch.ting.com. You can go to their website. You can check out the savings calculator. It's super easy. And uh, it's, you know, for, for cell phone carriers in the U.S. where it is a pain in the butt to get what you want, they make it so that it is not like that at all. So uh, 25 bucks off your first device when you, when you sign up through twitch.ting.com. And uh, they want you to go ahead and start saving today. And I think we can all support that. We would thank Ting for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware.
Yay. Thank you, Ting. Viewer questions. Should we fire a few of those out? Should we answer a few Absolutely. questions from our beloved audience? Alex has a question about mini ITX and memory. He says, your spot last week on the Indiegogo funding project for the N-Case M1 was really intriguing. I dig what those guys are trying to do with small form factor computing, and I think it's super cool of Leanne Lee to get on board the way they did. I'll admit to being a novice when it comes to the mini ITX form factor. I had exclusively been interested in regular ATX boards, but after doing some research, I've got to say I'm hesitant to invest for one reason, RAM. That may be observed on an Intel board that can support 16 gigabytes of memory, but I run multiple virtual machines in parallel on my current system for work, and I'm usually static at 15 gigabytes of memory reserved. I'm worried about future-proofing, and so, sadly, I think that beautiful case will be relegated to being a simple media server box. Dude. Here's my question. What's the big restriction keeping RAM DIMMs pegged at 8 gigabytes per slot on Intel motherboards? Is there an upgrade coming in a new chipset in the future, or am I just so much of an outlier that the demand simply isn't there as larger boards with more slots can expand to significantly more memory? I noticed a pair of AMD FM2 socket boards that support up to 32 gigabytes, so I assume it's possible. I'm curious what technical limitations, if any, are holding Intel back, or whether it's simply an issue of economics. Ryan, I'm going to lay this one gently at your feet. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, my. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't really know. The issue is that there's only two dim slots typically on these these types of motherboards. Um, right. Eight gigs per slot. The, the reason that is a restriction is because the way the memory controllers work and the way mm -hmm. that the, the, the actual pinouts from the processor that go to these DIMM slots are. And I'm guessing that we're, because you're not pegged at eight gigs per channel because you can have 64 right. gigs of memory on a Z77 platform motherboard if you use four uh, uh, eight gig, no, I'm sorry, on a, on a LGA 2011 motherboard, you could have 64. On a Z77, you can have 32 with four 8 gig modules. And with two DIMMs, you only get 16 gig module or 16 gigs total. Um, it's just a restriction of the processor and the architecture of the platform. Uh, you're not going to be able to change it. If 16 gigs is not enough, then mm -hmm. I, then you know, that's that sucks. You're going to have to not buy a mini ITX platform, I guess, right? I because I understand what he's right. he's talking about running lots of, of virtual machines, which can eat up a lot of memory. Uh, so, you, you know, you could go with, even check some micro ATX motherboards instead of mini ITX motherboards, because there might be some micro ATX motherboards that have four DIMM slots, so it lets you to double add to 32 gigs of system memory. Uh, otherwise, you're looking at full-size ATX platform and, you know, a, a full-size ATX case, I guess. So, mm -hmm. I, I just think that the num number of people that need more than 16 gigs of memory on a mini ITX platform is pretty small. Yeah. And uh, when you're talking about a mini ITX motherboard, think about what size it is, how many components they need to get on that motherboard, right? The processor socket and the, the space for heat sink on that is by far the biggest user of space, right? And then they have to get all the VRM equipment on it. They have to get a chipset. They have to get, you know, uh, third-party USB chipsets maybe or SATA controllers right. plus a PCI Express slot and all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, it's just, I mean, it's, it's hard to do. It, it's 6.7 inches by 6.7 inches and one yeah. entire wall of that of that board is covered with the ports that go on the back of the case, right? So yep. <laughs> it's 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 a non-trivial endeavor to try to pack all the memory inside of there. Yep. I would I, I you know, I got to say it, you know, it's are SO dims restricted are they capped at 8 gigabytes uh, by their nature or do, can we expect sometime in the future like a 16 gigabyte SO dim? So dims, um, so so dims aren't restricted any more than regular dims, right? It's just uh, the uh, the matter of you're you're shrinking you're shrinking it again, so it's going to make it a little bit smaller, make it a little bit more expensive to get more dense, uh, right. you know, memory chips on there and that kind of stuff. So uh, it's you know I, I, that's not it's not really gonna it's not any worse. There's, it's going to be a little bit more expensive, but it's not going to be any better either. <sighs> I sigh. I am sad. <laughs> All right. Let's take another email. This one comes in from Kevin about a GPU upgrade. He says, I've been thinking about upgrading my video card for some time now, and I need some suggestions. He has an NVIDIA 8800 GT, and he's looking to spend anywhere from $200 to $350. 
which is a pretty big range. And then his sweet spot is from 250 to 300. He prefers NVIDIA over AMD, but not opposed to AMD. I want to use uh, this in a dual card setup. And with the recent issues found with Crossfire, I think NVIDIA SLI would be a better way to go. In addition, if I upgrade, will I run into any problems or speed issues running on older Core 2 Duo E4600 at 2.4 gigahertz. I don't want to end up purchasing the card, then to find my system is the bottleneck. Just want to know so I can then uh, factor in a new motherboard, CPU, RAM upgrade, etc. I can pull those specs from the hardware leaderboard, which is a great place. Uh, information about the system, he has a Core 2 Duo, P35 chipset, ICH9 Southbridge, 4 gigs of DDR2. Um, so this is this is a tough one because... That is a that is a pretty old platform. That's a pretty old processor motherboard memory combination. Yes. Well, in terms of the GPU, it's a pretty easy question, right? It's a it's a Radeon HD seventy eight seventy versus a, a GTX six sixty. You know, in that yeah. two hundred. You know, that the, that's kind of the the two hundred and fifty ish dollar cards of choice in HD seventy eight seventy versus a GTX six sixty. That part's easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and and either of those cards is going to be good. Um, if you can splurge, I, I really like the GTX 660 Ti over the 660. If you can, I think the Ti is like in the 320 range. Um, so it's, it is a little bit more and it falls a little bit over his sweet spot. But I really like that card more than the 660. And then the 7870 gigahertz edition card is right up there with it. Um, maybe even the 70, like if you can find a really good deal on a 7950, you can stay in that range too. But um, I do think that upgrading to one of those cards on this platform, you are going to start to see CPU bottlenecking on, on the performance. I don't know if it's, it's not going to be horrible. He didn't mention what specific games maybe, but there's going to be a difference if you were to run that card on a Ivy bridge platform versus a core two duo platform for sure. I mean, cause I, it, it, you know, the nice thing is he can take that card. He, you know, if he wants to buy the card first, he can buy the card first, get, you know, all the GPU performance he can out of yeah. his Core 2 Duo. But the Core 2 Duo is definitely going to be a bottleneck, and upgrading that to, like, a Core i5 would be a pretty massive upgrade I would, in terms of performance. I, I would even recommend, because he says he's planning on using it on a multi-GPU setup, you know, I would say buy one 660 or 660 Ti or 7870, and then rather than buy a second card, buy a processor and a motherboard and memory with that other 300 something dollars, you know, with that other right. 300 bucks. Um, and as Patrick said, what I'm always a proponent of is <laughs> buy that card now. And if it turns out you want to upgrade your CPU, then do that down the road, right? You don't have to do it that same day. It's not like you won't be able to play games. Like it'll be worse or something like that. It will definitely be better. <laughs> it just won't be as good as it could be. Uh, and then you can, you know, the next month or two months later say, okay, now it's time for me to get uh, an Ivy Bridge platform or, you know, a higher end AMD platform, whatever it is you're going to get uh, and and maybe hold off on the second GPU for a little bit longer. That's that that's the direction I would go uh, if you're trying to space out your upgrades, right? <laughs> Definitely start with the GPU, go with processor platform, then another right. GPU down the road. Yeah, it's funny, but I was laughing because you know I'm I've got a I'm I'm desperate to upgrade my GPU, you know, and I'm kind of like, oh, I, I think I've got some money that I can actually do it for a change, and uh, I, that is totally my sweet spot. Now I'm gonna save some more money so I can buy a GTX 660 Ti. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Gosh darn it! <laughs> we got an email from John about another 27-inch monitor option. Says I just watched episode 200. Thanks for watching. I heard you mention that monitor price is backlogged on the 27-inch IPS monitor. If you are in the market for a 27-inch IPS monitor from a retailer you can trust, Micro Center carries one for 400 bucks. I first came across this in an email ad for them on 11-19-2012 and saw that they had several in stock, which I confirmed by visiting my local store. Their website still shows it available 10-plus in my local store. If you have a Micro Center near you, you can have instant gratification and a return policy Otherwise, it's just another online option or another domestic online option. If you, despite the fact that everyone seems to be having great success, uh, I can, I have, I've run into people who are like, you, you're going to have an overnight you a monitor from Korea. And I'm like, isn't that amazing? Amazon delivered weird. my lawnmower overnight. <laughs> <laughs> It's just I, you know, I didn't. I didn't know Micro Center had these. Three ninety nine is about fifty, sixty dollars more than the eBay models. But you, you do if it's near you, you have the advantage of a return 
uh, right. a warranty, right? Somebody that you can go talk to or complain to or whatever. I don't know anything about this particular model, though I will probably guess that they're all pretty much exactly the same. Um, mm. I don't know if this one has visa mounts. If it does, that could be cool. Uh, but it is, I like the idea of the instant gratification as well. <laughs> You're a big so, fan of instant gratification. I'm a big fan of instant gratification. So, <laughs> One last one before we go. You want to read email, uh, Nick's email about the Google Pixel? Sure. So this is, uh, we, we talked about over the last couple of weeks, the Google Pixel 25 by 17 um, laptop. And we had some interesting thoughts on it. Nick wanted to add his two cents in as well. He says, something you have to remember is that you can only make web apps uh, using the web as the programming environment. You are limited by the hardware of the users. If no users have powerful systems, then you have to make simple apps. If you have access to i5 and i7 processors, then you have to make, or I'm sorry, then in more memory, you've just opened up the type of apps that you can create. Why create apps that no one can run? Google has to get the hardware into people's hands so developers have the hardware to create better and more powerful programs. Google has its own Nexus 7 and 10, so it can push development for those form factors. There is a chicken and egg problem, and this is Google's best way of solving that. Open up some Google stores, and not only do you have Google Glass show and tell, but you can do workshops to pimp the Pixel and hopefully a new desktop PC like an iMac Mini with similar PC performance, which will enable these powerful apps. Give it time, and Microsoft has something to worry about. So what do you think about that, the idea that if 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 these types of high res high performance Chromebooks right. are start to catch on, that we'll see, you know, applications that you would not have otherwise seen on these platforms. It's a good theory. Um, I, we're going to have to wait to to see what evolves out of that. But I mean, you know, he's he's got it. I got to say, you know, Nick's got an excellent point. If you don't have fast hardware, nobody's going to design anything to run on fast hardware. Um, yeah, I'm, like, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I like what I want is a photo editing, like a Photoshop type thing for right. Chrome OS, but it's, you don't have local storage. You have, right. you have, so I guess these have 32 gigs, I guess. So you have, I don't know if they're going to have to change the operating system and kind of the mentality of that where they're, you're not downloading Photoshop every time you want to use it. It's, you know, it's, it's actually stored locally, kind of like an installation, you know, and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. I, but I, I love I love the hardware that the Pixel is. Yeah. I just wish I believed more in the software ecosystem that it has out right now. I mean, it's interesting because one of the things that I was I was reading a discussion on uh, on uh, online, and, and one of the ideas it's like you know the Chromium OS is is it's not really a general PC operating system. They don't want right. to deal with qualifying it on thirty two thousand different. You know what I mean? Because the you you start getting into all the variations. You know, all the strange little PCI cards or, or additional, you know, I mean, there's there's so many possible variations on, you know, an Intel processor and motherboard and GPU mm. and, you know, all the additional add-in cards there. The qualification is a nightmare, right? And, and right. Google wants very tight. They have a very specific model for this device. You know, your microwave oven, your HDTV, you hit a button. Boom, you have a picture. You hit a button, boom, it starts cooking. They want it to be something that it's instantaneous or as instantaneous as the technology it can deliver. So, right. you know, it's interesting to watch them try to push that envelope into more high end stuff. Uh, I'm curious to see where it goes. I'm curious to see where the Chromium OS goes over time. Um, but, you know, there's logic there. You know, at some point, um, to get eggs, you need a chicken, or to get chickens, you need an egg. <laughs> yeah, all those things. You know, and you know, at some point, you need to plan a steak in the road to get your chicken uh, to mix it for <laughs> as I could in one malformed sentence. <laughs> it's kind of, I'm kind of curious to see what, uh, you know, what uh, Google can do over time with that hardware. Because you know, the the flip side of that, the invert of that, is watching. Uh, you know, we were talking about on on Techzilla about you know where are the three hundred dollar Windows RT tablets? Well, they don't exist. Um, you know, they're probably not going to exist for a while. Um, you know, and that's yeah. that's got to be a tough position to be in. You know, now obviously, like Microsoft, you know, like we're business vertical platforms, but um, you know, when you're looking at the ability to go to Amazon and get a branded, uh, you know, familiar, trustworthy name bolted onto a two hundred dollar seven inch tablet that'll be in your hands tomorrow morning, um, 
that's tough competition. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see where that evolves because, you know, Chrome as an OS is not only competing against, um, you know, uh, you know, OS 10 and Linux and Windows. It's also competing to a certain degree against, you know, Android and, yep. uh, and iOS. So Definitely. it's curious. It's curious and I'm curious to see where it goes and I'm curious to see at some point if they, 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 they try to leverage it all into a browser or, or an actual PC operating system. Could be cool. I'm excited. Yeah, <laughs> we're excited. That's about it for this edition of Twitch this week in computer hardware. Mr. Shrout, what's coming up on PC Per this week? Any deep, exciting secrets you can reveal to us? Do you guys like graphics cards? We love graphics cards. Good. March <laughs> is your month. March is going to be your... Yeah, be excited. Because I'm not right minute. now. But Wait a minute. Be excited. Wait a minute. Okay, so while you're watching March Madness and running benchmarks and pounding your head against the wall every time a benchmark crashes... Um, are you saying that those of us who are buying a GPU might want to wait a few weeks? Eh. No, okay. not really. <laughs> <laughs> no, Ryan it's just going to be it's just going to be an interesting month. I'm, I it's going to okay. be it's going to be an interesting month. We have other stuff coming up as well. We've got um, we're we're finally taking a, a roundup of some of the uh, Windows RT devices. We're going to take a look at that kind of thing. Um, we have some. We have a. We still have. We're looking at a lot of mini, actually, ironically, mini ITX motherboards over the next two weeks as well. I think we've got a handful of those in. So if you're looking for uh, super small form factor stuff. And Z77 is going to be around for a lot longer than people thought. Even mm -hmm. if Haswell comes out in the middle of the year, uh, it looks like Z77 is going to continue throughout 2013. So we, we expect that to be a continuing focus too. Nice. Yep. We're, uh, I, I'm going to have my Linux Steam Gaming Extravaganza. We're finally having our, uh, our follow-up on the joy, the utter joy that is uh, building your own NAS system. we got a new Raspberry Pi uh, segment coming up next week. And I'm working on my $100 audiophile starter kit, <laughs> which has been kind of a fun experiment. It's amazing what you can find on Amazon if you search far enough, um, including... A decent $20 amp and a $50 set of speakers. You got to start somewhere with your audio gear. And, and it's yep. interesting to see how much you can get for so little. Taxilla, T-E-K-Z-I-L-L-A is the name of the website where you can find me. Uh, Version3.com slash Taxilla if you want to spell longer things. PCPer.com is Mr. Shrout's home on the interwebs. Uh, you can also find at Patrick Norton and the beloved at Ryan Shrout because we are so creative on the Twitters. <laughs> I, f I figure it's easier for people to find us that way. That's got to be why. You don't want to be like Super Dude GPU 4X77? No, actually, I have zero interest in that. <laughs> that's reasonable. All right, that's about it for this week in Twitch. I'm Patrick Norton. This week in computers. <laughs> this week in this computer weekend, hardware. This week in computer hardware. No, that fits. No, that's good. Twitch it's like the summary at the end. <laughs> It's almost like I can speak, except I can't. <laughs> Twitch at twit.tv is the email if you want to ask us a question or tell me that I'm an idiot who can't speak. I will engage and, and uh, enjoy all of those emails. <laughs> twit.tv slash Twitch is the place to find more of our episodes or to find the information on how to subscribe to the show to make sure you get each and every episode. That's about it for this edition of Twitch. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Schrout. We'll see you next week on Twitch. <laughs>